I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I intend to talk with you tonight about um, some skills, important ones, in relationships, notably the skill of holding our viewpoints, our beliefs lightly and not contracting in problematic ways around them. But before I get into that, I'd like to talk about uh, two things first. Uh, the first is a comment and question that came in from Carol Birch at 57 minutes past the hour. And I'll use your name, Carol, because you used it when you posted it publicly. Take a look at what Carol has written there. I'll read it. Recently, I was in a violent car accident. When I try to meditate, scenes pop into my mind from that incident. I am unable to let them pass through. Should I give up on meditation for now, or is there something else I can do to let them pass through? Extremely important question. So <clears throat> let's assume that Carol has tried some skillful things when intrusive imagery uh, or other intrusive content, mental content, surge up when we you know, relax and open into meditation. Uh, let's assume that Carol, for example, has just kept bringing her attention back to some simple sensations, such as those of breathing. Or let's assume also that Carol has maybe brought in a sense of uh, companions with her or lovingness and warm-heartedness in general flowing in and flowing out to give her a sense of social support that is also would tend to push the imagery from the car accident off to the side as she focuses on other things. And let's suppose she's tried that and it hasn't worked. Um, let's suppose also, and this is a sophisticated method that's grounded in insight, but let's suppose that Carol has uh, used what's called vipassana or insight to observe that the mental content, the experience of uh, scenes from the accident popping into the mind, that those scenes from the accident, the imagery and the related feelings uh, that go with that, body sensations, emotions, and so on, um, are, like all experiences, made up of parts that are connected and changing, and thus foamy and cloud-like and insubstantial and uh, lacking inherent essence or identity. In other words, there's a recognition of the emptiness, potentially, of this intrusive, upsetting, understandably, uh, mental content. And in so doing, as we recognize the emptiness, it's there emptily. Uh, it's there cloud-likely rather than brick like clay inside our awareness, as we do that, it feels less burdensome, feels less weighty or compelling or invasive. That's a sophisticated technique grounded in insight that develops over time, but can still be a very effective one. So, <clears throat> and there, there may be some other methods as well, but let's suppose that, that Carol has tried that, or you've tried that, let's say, with other upsetting material that just keeps coming up and hijacking uh, your attention. Then what? I think it's very important, and this is consistent with research on um, casualties of mindfulness, to put it a certain way, it's, it's good to step out. Um, you could, if you wanted to, try the fourth technique um, in addition to the to the three I've mentioned, of getting up and moving around and being meditative or aware of your body, let's say, as you walk uh, up and down or in a circle or you know, down the street. Uh, you could try that, getting more active. But let's suppose basically that you've tried certain things and you know it's still there. It's, it's pretty useful to just 
step out. Uh, yeah, you could continue witnessing it. You could try witnessing it mindfully for some limited period of time, five or 10 minutes, you know, with spaciousness and awareness and compassion for yourself and, and not judging the content, not trying to push it away or nor let it invade you. You could try that for a while. But what if you just keep getting pulled into it because it's so intense and this could be like other trauma material. Then it's generally indicated to step out of the meditative frame. Uh, otherwise, there can be a reinforcing of that material, a re-traumatizing, and also it just is upsetting. If there's no gain, <laughs> why just marinate in the pain, in other words? This is especially important if you're doing long meditative practice and states of mind arise that just are bad for you and they are they have a kind of compelling quality. It's important to disengage from them and not let them um, take you into a, a bad place. Instead of meditating, you might want to certainly turn toward wholesome things that are supportive for you the kindness of others, uh, you know, the look of a flower, you know, drinking some water, uh, whatever is helpful for you. I'm reading, <laughs> I'm rereading a novel that I like a lot these days. Whatever might be helpful to you, that's useful. Additionally, it could help to strengthen certain general capacities like um, mindfulness or calming, relaxing, a sense of your own intactness that in the present, you're basically all right right now. And um, as an intact person, as an intact being, challenging, painful, difficult material can be present in you, but you are still whole. This is very important to feel whole and at home in yourself, even as horrible things arise uh, in awareness. You could strengthen those things and then See what happens after you do that for a month or two or three. Also, obviously, exploring uh, you know, focus therapy for trauma uh, and really going after it, really trying to help your brain you know, clear uh, the emotional engram, it's called, the, you know, that memory, in, in effect, that's, that's deep in the body. Um, verbal methods kind of break down with emotional or physically traumatizing material. And so, you know, exploring useful methods for clearing trauma, find ones that work for you. Um, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, somatic experiencing, uh, sensory motor therapy, other, other approaches for dealing with trauma that might be helpful for you. People are finding, uh, see for yourself, uh, that often using um, psychotropics, um, uh, psychedelics, plant medicines, or other means, you know, in a very skillful, skillful, controlled, structured process can also sometimes be really helpful with trauma. So, you know, doing what you can about it, and then if you like, coming back to the meditation uh, and giving yourself a break meanwhile. <laughs> it's not that you're a bad meditator, it's that a really tough thing happened to you and when you settle a little bit as you meditate, understandably, whoosh, the brain throws it up again. The brain's trying to help it process and process on its way out, but it can get stuck somehow and because we're maybe not ready to fully process it out. So take good care of yourself and don't feel that you have to keep meditating um, if something intrusive and upsetting like a violent car accident, as Carol wrote, you know, has arisen for you. Okay. On a very different track, um, I would just like to remind those of you who may need a reminder, and probably most, if not all of you don't, that um, in America, at least, we have a very significant um, collection of elections occurring now. Uh, people are voting now uh, and finishing up in early November. And uh, Voting is not partisan. And uh, so I want to really encourage you to encourage others to get out and make your voices known. As John Lewis, uh, bless his memory, 
said, democracy is not a state, it's an act. It's an act, it's a verb. And it's only through uh, the verb of voting that we can really maintain a healthy democracy for ourselves and for generations to come, literally. Uh, there are resources for voting that I'm sure people are putting in the chat, um, people who can help you get to the polls or people who can you know, just kind of give you uh, information about what's at stake or different points of view. And at the end of the day, it's up to you. Uh, but if we don't participate in the great democratic process, which is rare and very recent in human history over the last 10,000 years, certainly, um, since we kind of lost democracy as we moved out of hunter-gatherer bands into larger populations with concentrations of wealth and power, uh, you know, democracy is precious. It's fragile. It can be lost. It is being lost in certain countries of the world today, and it's at risk of being lost uh, in America. So, you know, out of compassion for others, if for no other reason, uh, you know, I encourage you to vote. Okay. So, on with. Uh, what I thought I was going to talk about tonight, which is attachment to view. And let me um, kind of frame that for you and get into that for you uh, in this sort of way. You may know that the Buddha pointed out that craving, broadly stated, you know, a kind of must or insistence or grabbing or pushing away or clinging, creates a lot of suffering and harm. And he also pointed out that there are four major, there might be some others, but there are definitely four major objects of craving, sometimes described as objects of attachment. I'm going to use the word craving because there is healthy attachment, certainly, such as between parents and children. Um, so what are these four classic objects of craving? The first, or there are no particular order, um, one of these is the um, is craving for pleasure or for the ending of pain or for the continuing of relatedness. And that is summarized as craving related to sense pleasures or attachment or clinging related to sense pleasures. In other words, we want to keep the pleasures going and we want the pains to go away. In your relationships, you can immediately think about the application of this. Because as soon as something starts to feel unpleasant, then craving starts to follow. Push away the unpleasant, or make a change, or go to war with the unpleasant, or flee from the unpleasant, or freeze in the face of it. Or in relationships, maybe there's something really pleasurable, really nice. Now we want more of that. We grasp for it. We try to hold on to it. We try to keep it. We try to possess it. Creates problems right there. So awareness of craving related to pleasure and pain and really broadly and subtly relatedness um, can be a very useful thing to become aware of. Second object of craving um, often is translated as rites and rituals. Today, we might describe it as routines and familiar patterns. Although in the, in the traditional focus on rites and rituals in early Buddhism, there was a critique of empty rituals performed often by priests to help people have a, a better life or to somehow get the gods to smile upon them. And one thing we can be aware of, including in our relationships, is a sense of getting stuck in um, patterns of interacting, habits of interacting that start to take on a ritualistic quality. They become fairly script-based, as if you're watching actors in a play. And maybe the actors change and the scenes change, but the fundamental script, the basic plot, the storyline keeps occurring again and again and again. And we can get stuck in these. We can crave for them. Uh, for example, when I was young, uh, as a shy kid in school, my identity was kind of organized around being smart and having the answer to things. So 
when I would enter into a new situation, especially one that was familiar for me, um, I would look for ways to be smart, to, to know things. That was my familiar script, my familiar ritual of sorts. And then I would try to cast other people into the role of needing me to be smart because I knew things they didn't. And on and on it went. That would be an example. You might think about um, script-like uh, rituals, if you will, or modes of interacting with others uh, in your life today that you might feel a little trapped in and might be interested in loosening up about or stepping out of. All right. Third object of craving, classically, is the sense of self or a belief in a self. Uh, this shows up around taking things personally with other people. Uh, I'm involved in an organization, um, the Global Compassion Coalition, that's emerging now. And early on, I kind of used certain words to describe what I thought we had to do or you know, certain distinctions. And as more and more people get involved, they very understandably uh, propose other words in some cases or want to, you know, maybe collapse some of the distinctions I was drawing or offer other distinctions. And I have to be mindful of the ways I might take that personally Ooh. and get possessive about my point of view or my position, right? Getting identified with it. We have to be careful about that in our relationships. One of the things that's extremely useful to be mindful of, including in terms of what we started talking about before our formal beginning, about granularity of mindfulness. In other words, becoming aware in real time of things that happen over a time course of mere seconds, including potentially fractions of seconds, little points of view, little sensations in the body, little emotions, little desires, images, plans that can just go by really quickly. One of the things to be particularly aware of with your growing granularity of mindfulness during small periods of time and about uh, small uh, nuances or details of things is to become aware of how the self, the sense of self, gets pulled in to our interactions with other people and especially gets pulled in when we're having conflicts or tension or unmet needs even with other people, their unmet needs or our own. And you can just watch your mind. You're observing what's happening. You said X, they replied Y, and then you can start to observe an emotional reaction arising to the Y that they said, which is associated with a sense of me, mine, I, the sense of self. And you can observe the sense of self decreasing, increasing, ebbing and flowing based on what's happening around you and also inside you, which is really useful to appreciate the kind of dynamic nature of self-thing, self-thing as an activity, as a process. This is very useful in interactions. Am I taking it personally? Am I feeling narcissistically wounded in terms of my self-esteem? Am I feeling devalued? Is this pulling up other very self-referential emotional memories of others when I was young who made me feel small as a self? or worthless, or broken, unlovable, perhaps. See, becoming aware of these self-saturated or self-referential associations to simply the facts of what is occurring right now, really, really useful. Now, this does not mean letting other people push you around. It's thoroughly appropriate to stand up for persons whether it's other persons or this person who happens to you know, be wearing your name tag. It's thoroughly appropriate to stand up for persons. Paradoxically, we become more effective typically in doing that over the long term if we take things less personally and we um, stand up for ourselves on the basis of more 
um, objective and impersonal facts and more universal and thus impersonal values. Uh, that's a whole conversation, a whole exploration about doing that. But I just want to flag the third of four objects of craving on my way into the fourth of these, which is what I want to particularly talk about. The fourth object of craving that the Buddha emphasized and said was really valuable to pay attention to is our views, our beliefs, our background assumptions, our frame of reference or meaning we give to things, or our belief about the underlying intentions or attitudes or mental processes of the other person, or the qualities that we attribute to them and our beliefs about that in other people. Um, our beliefs about how good or bad something is, how big a deal or not a big deal something is. These are all beliefs. There's no way around having cognitions of one kind or another, and it's you know uh, perhaps uh, worth keeping in mind that in the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, in the order in which these are presented, typically the first one is wise view or right view. There is a place for clarity that, oh yeah, there's a red light there. I should stop. That's wise view. Or recognizing, oh, my partner, or my colleague at work seems a little miffed by me or unsettled by what I said there, I need to be able to see that as reality. And then I need to be able to um, think about what I can do about it. There's a place for wise view. But isn't it true though also that very often we contract around a particular belief about a situation or a person? or ourselves that then becomes problematic. So I wanna offer two <clears throat> examples here. And I really encourage you to think about uh, a difficult relationship maybe, or a recent conflict, or you're still really maybe worked up about something, you're still real irritated about it whenever you think about it. Think about something quite real here and identify one or more beliefs you have about what happened or the other person or yourself. And then see if you can step back from that belief. For starters, as you step back from it, after you identify it, and it sometimes can help to just say it out loud, put it into language, um, you know, they're wrong. They don't like me, or um, I'm pathetic, unlovable. Those are beliefs. Or shoulds. They should do this or that, or should not do this or that. You know, declare it to yourself. And then ask yourself first, what else is true? You're not directly confronting the belief. What else is true? What else is true? And after you do that a little bit, you might um, ask yourself, what is not true about this belief? Maybe the way the belief is expressed is that it's unqualified. It's not bounded in any way. It's just broad generalization. You might ask yourself, hmm, you know, what, what are the ways it's not true? In other words, well, it's, it's true about that particular situation, but it's not true about the relationship as a whole. Or it is true about that other person when they're cranky. And most of the time, they're not that way. Right? So what is the belief in a relationship? Like an expectation or a rule about other people, uh, an assumption, a meaning you gave. You know, they... There I was in, in bed and maybe I was hoping to get romantic and they just kind of rolled over and, huh, they're not interested in sex anymore. Well, maybe <laughs> what's really true is they did not really understand what you were interested in or maybe what was really true is they were just fried or exhausted or maybe what was really true is that 
you know, it's been kind of awkward between you recently, and they're not interested in makeup sex. Maybe. Uh, the Things need to be really all green lights on the relationship dashboard before we're going to go down that, that erotic road. Maybe that's what's really going on here, rather than the belief, oh, they they're they're cold or they don't want they don't want me or they're not interested in in you know that aspect of our relationship anymore and so you you can challenge the belief so what is the belief what is also true and what is not true about the belief that's a very useful thing so i want to apply this to two things and then um, scan the uh the chat to see what comments you might have and feel really free and to give examples, if you're willing to, in the public chat, of beliefs you've had about yourself, others, the world, the future, the past, that have been problematic for you in relationships, and you're, you're coming out of them. That'll help us make more, more real for people. All right? So as I said, <clears throat> two examples. And um, the first of these is a belief about yourself that you really want to challenge, you know, that's relevant in your relationships, right? And I'll give you two about myself that are kind of, I won't say embarrassing, but probably embarrassing. Um, one belief about myself that's actually had a lot of uh, consequences for other people is because of the nature of my childhood as a kind of shy, awkward kid off to the side and whose parents uh, had a monopoly on anger in my family. It wasn't abusive or horrible, but we, I was raised at a time starting in the early, in the early 1950s in which children were, should be seen and not heard and should be always well-behaved and quiet and obedient and you know, good kids. Well, my belief about myself was that I was a mild, somewhat weak person. And what I've gradually been prodded to realize by my wife and my children and some other people is that actually I have the capacity to become really quite intense. I had no idea, honestly. To me, and also in my family, my parents were quite intense. So I thought on the intensity scale, I was like a two. And what I was intense about, nobody took issue with. They took issue with how intense I got about it. And I didn't realize how intense I got about it because I had a belief that I was just not an intense person. I was actually kind of mild and even weak. Um, and it took me a while to realize that I was having a lot of impact on people due to my intensity. You know, which was then turbocharged, you know, with, or fueled by intellect and, and, you know, my privilege also, I should add, or my, in society, my standing in society for all kinds of reasons. That was an example. So you might ask yourself, have you had a belief about yourself that has, you know, led to some difficulty maybe with other people? Um, another belief I've, I've had about myself, uh, again, this is fairly personal, is that in some deep sense, I just wasn't very cool. I was like a door, you know, awkward dork and just not very likable or why would anyone be interested in me or why would anyone want to include me? Really, you know, I had that belief kind of running in the background, especially entering into groups, uh, even well through my 40s and 50s probably, having done a ton of inner work still, these old beliefs. Uh, that we acquire, especially in childhood, can have a long shadow. So there too, maybe you've had beliefs um, that have just been wrong about what kind of person you are and have led you to play smaller than you need to play or have led you to um, just be harsh toward yourself, critical of yourself, and have led you to maybe not step out into the world or seek relationships uh, with people. Definitely. Uh, this belief led me to just kind of swerve away from reaching out to people that I thought were kind of above me in standing or coolness or popularity or likability. And like, mm, I just hunkered down and swerved away. Has anything like that been happening for you? 
So now I want to give example, and I invite you to consider a belief about a key person in your life or um, situations you're grappling with and a belief that you want, want to challenge here, a viewpoint or a meaning you want to challenge here. So um, <clears throat> I'll uh, give you an example of, of one, <laughs> maybe a little embarrassing about myself, and you can think about this maybe for yourself. Uh, so while driving with my wife, uh, and you may have heard me give driving with the, my wife examples before, this is maybe a little different, uh, she would express alarm <laughs> sometimes at how I was driving. And I would get defensive about it. Uh, I just thought, I'm driving okay. No problem. Um, I, my dad taught me to drive. He was fairly critical of my driving. And initially as a kid, 16, learning to drive, like, Rrr. and I would get defensive about it. And the belief I had was that she was trying to control me. So my framing, this is a very useful way to think about it, put it in a hierarchy of power. That was the frame I incorporated, her anxious clutching at the door handle uh, or literally pushing the floorboard with her foot and the brake um, just was that she wanted to control me. She was gonna be the dominator, kind of like my dad teaching me to drive, the dominator frame. For her, it wasn't in that frame at all. It wasn't in that frame at all. But I believed she was orienting to me in that controlling, dominating way. No, she was just scared <laughs> and sharing her experience for a certain lot of reasons. One is just, I do tend to drive briskly, I will admit it. Um, and, uh, you know, she, also just her style. She tends to be, you know, a little more anxious um, and not so experienced in driving. I'm, I've driven in a lot in my life. And so um, I interpreted it. That was my belief about her, that she was A, wanting to control me, and B, that she was uh, really critical of me. That was like the emphasis I put on what she was saying. Yeah, there was some criticism in it, but mostly it was a very human expression of her experience of fear, of anxiety. And as my beloved partner and mate, um, she, um, you know, was just asking for help, basically. So instead of an order, which is how I interpreted it, it was really a request. And, and instead of trying to dominate me, she was actually being vulnerable with anxiety and fear she was feeling as we were driving. And I, over time, gradually, I'm still less than perfect, but I'm trying to get better. Uh, with my granularity of mindfulness in real time, uh, trying to get better at not misinterpreting what she is saying or doing, and instead, you know, challenging my automatic reflexive interpretations of what's happening, so, uh, and so I can over time see more clearly. So you too, you might think about interpretations of other people or ways that you're putting it that. Um, have created maybe trouble for you, right? View. And then the last thing I wanna offer here, and then I'll open it up to where I see some, some questions coming in the chat and so forth, um, is that through meditation, and this is why I structured the meditation tonight in the ways that I did, we often have this sense <clears throat> of the whole field and our mind is fairly quiet. And we're basically being, we're, we're simply being. And then we start to think about something. And that sense of the whole field whoosh, disappears or moves very much the foot background. And there's a kind of coalescing of attention around a particular thought or reaction or image. Very often a combination of thought, emotion, sensation and desire. And then after a while, we notice we're doing that and we go out again. We disengage from this kind of coalescing or eddy in the stream, in my metaphor, you may have heard me use, this contraction 
which often has subtle associated body sensations that involve contraction, pressure, tension even. We recognize it, and then in the recognition, whoosh, that contraction dissolves, it disperses, whoosh, and we go back out to that sense of like a wider field, more of a spaciousness. It's really, really useful to notice, isn't it? And um, so two points here, and then I'll take a really close look at some questions and comments that have come in about all this. The first point is that when you're aware of your view, a belief that has a cognitive component, often expressed in language, when you're aware of that, ask yourself, what are the associated emotions or attitudes? Ask yourself, what are the associated somatic qualities, such as tension or tightening in certain parts of your body, or a, an, a kind of movement, or holding on your body, or posture, or facial expression that is associated with that particular belief or view? That's really useful. Ask yourself, when you're aware of a, a view in your mind that that you want to explore or challenge, what are the desires associated with it? That view might be in the service of certain desires, or that view might naturally initiate desires related to it. In other words, if I have an underlying desire to not knuckle under to anyone's thumb, based on my childhood kind of running in the background, then if my wife says, ah, scared. Uh, I would tend to, you know, incorporate that my, I would tend to generate a view that would be consistent with my underlying desires to not knuckle under anyone. And I would interpret as a view that what she's trying to do is boss me around. See? So desires can generate views and views can generate desires. And often it happens as kind of a package. Being aware of one, two, three, of uh, emotions, um, sensations, and um, desires associated with our beliefs and views is really, really useful. That's point one. Point two, on my way to looking at specific questions here, is to help yourself disengage. When you find yourself contracting around a belief about yourself, or others that's relevant in your relationships when you're contracting around that or you discover around that. It's a really good neurological trick to make yourself either look out toward the horizon or um, get a sense of things as a whole or take a kind of bird's eye panoramic perspective on whatever belief or viewpoint you've developed. Because what that does, when we get a sense of things, is when we raise our gaze to the horizon, or when we get a sense of things as a whole, or we take a panoramic perspective, what that tends to do is act like a circuit breaker and disrupt the sort of ruminating, muttering, thinking, self-referential processing that uh, fuels are problematic views and is embedded in them. And you can just try it. The next time you're you know, really uh, contracting around an interpretation of what's happening in a relationship or you know, like a righteously held viewpoint or you're getting identified with something you think about a person or a situation, just try it. While you're thinking that, raise your gaze or get a sense of your body as a whole or the room as a whole. Or third, imagine that you're witnessing this whole situation with this other person from this big panoramic perspective. That will really neurologically support you in disentangling from identification with the view and disentangling as the Buddha taught from cravings of various kinds associated with views.
All right. So let's see here. I think what I'll do is not tonight uh, speak with one specific person. Sorry about that. And I'm going to take a look at some of the questions or comments that have come through the chat. Wonderful examples. Like at 12 minutes past the hour, Sandy Martin writes, everything bad happens to me. I'm unlucky. That's a belief. Um, I believe that I am too sensitive. Catherine writes at 12 minutes past the hour, too sensitive to others teasing. Right there, the key word is too. Right? Well, um, maybe... Uh, you're appropriately sensitive to other people teasing you, possibly, right? Um, or maybe the truth is that you're particularly sensitive due to temperament or history. And also what is true is that you need to uh, protect yourself from teasing for a while so you don't keep getting resensitized to it. And you need to buy yourself some time. See what I'm saying? This is great, what people are putting in here. Uh, I, let's see, at 7.30, 7.13 p.m., the belief that I'm 100% responsible for my partner's mood. That's a really important one because if you believe that you are this responsible while factually you have only this much power or authority or influence, that will make you crazy. <laughs> you know, And is unsuccessful. So being 100% responsible for our partner's moods is really, you know, it's problematic because of course we don't have 100% influence over their mood. We have much less than 100% influence over our own mood. These are great, great examples. I will never be happy. Beliefs about the future or interpretations about the past. You may have heard me say that one of the really useful beliefs I changed was that I had been a wimp, a uh, weakling while growing up. And I realized, no, I was just a young, shy, skinny kid who in his own way was pretty tough actually and strong and determined, especially to deal with you know, the situation I was in. So that's a key belief. And another kind of belief is about the future, like I will never be happy. Um, that's a really <laughs> important belief to challenge. Okay, I appreciate some of the comments that have come in about me personally. Let's just see here if there's anything um, that's said. Okay, so Wendy writes at 16 minutes past the hour that my ex wants to hurt me, that his actions are intentional. Maybe the key word there that Wendy is being mindful of is wants. That's interesting. So sometimes we need to realize that another person really does want to hurt you. Sometimes they do. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes they are callous and cruel. Sometimes they're, they get they get off. They have gratifications from hurting other people uh, in various ways. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's true. Other times the truth is that they impact us, but their impacts on us are the result of a dozen factors swirling around in their mind, maybe one of which is intentionality, the other 11, let's say, are other kinds of things, and we can expand our view to recognize those other things. Meanwhile, we can protect ourselves as best we can from their impact on us, their impact on us. And I find one thing as a detail that's quite helpful with other people when we kind of, if we do, uh, discuss with them their impact. You know, maybe we use the structure of nonviolent communication. When you do X, just described very factually, without any topspin. When you do X, I feel Y. That's the impact. Because I need Z. You know, when you raise your voice and get really intense, I feel scared and small and like I want to get away because. Deep down, I need to feel safe, including with someone who's important to me. Okay, so let's suppose you've done that. And then the other person says, I'm not trying to make you feel small while raising their voice and getting big and leaning forward, okay? But anyway, they say, I am not. I didn't do that on purpose. Um, you know, just you're you, and then they give you an interpretation. You're like all those people who are trying to control me. I just need to be me. What do you do then? 
you could get into the usual quarrel in which you start arguing about what's going on in the black box of their mind, which they know more about often than we do, and we can't prove it anyway. Or you can just focus on impact. And you might say something like, hey, I really hear you. I wasn't saying that you did it intentionally. I, I wasn't really criticizing you. I was just saying how it is to be me. How it is to be me. And I'm just kind of wondering what we can do about that, you know? Like, we just, because I know that you don't want me to feel scared and small and like I want to get away from you. Um, I don't want to feel that way. How can we, see, now we, uh, just sort of address this impact and uh, figure out something that will work for both of us? It's a very different kind of frame. In other words, getting out of the argument about intention. You did it on purpose. No, I didn't do it on purpose. Mom, he did it on purpose. No. And you're off and running. Getting out of that and just focusing on impact and going forward into the future. Okay. Well, I should finish up and uh, give you a chance here to kind of let this all sink in. So if we could, I'd like to just take a few breaths opening out into that panoramic perspective, that bird's eye view, and reflect on what's been relevant for you in what we've explored here about craving related to views and what might be useful for you in your relationships, whether it's beliefs about yourself or beliefs about others or beliefs about the past with people or the future with people and to Explore holding those beliefs more lightly, unpacking them, being mindful of what they're associated to inside yourself, and being aware of what else could be true. And also, maybe some of the ways in which those beliefs are, are limited or even just simply mistaken. So letting this land and being aware of what you might want to take with you into your relationships from this in the hours and days to come. <laughs> 